All good? All right. Welcome, uh, Dan Lindsley with VMware, and presenting you on, on about um, some work I've done around rolling out orchestrator code uh, with Git and Concourse. Um, so, what we're trying to show here is like what what would be a good reason for ex, ex, uh, externalizing the content in VRO. So, first thing I want to ask, like, how many people are still using, uh, say, the like the package synchronization function within VRO? Yeah, so like your favorite way to manage content across different orchestrators. Um, what if, uh, so, you know, I see a lot of other scenarios where you just have like a Windows share full of dot package files, right, that have, they have different timestamps and whatnot. Is that what some other people do? Has anyone um, played with VRO8 yet? A little bit? Okay. So unfortunately, uh, all the content in this is not updated for VRO8 yet, unfortunately, but it's valid for everything, at all the sevens, so 7.0 through 7.6. Okay. So we're gonna look at why we wanna externalize the content, um, what Git is and why you wanna consider it if you haven't considered it at all for any or other automations or projects currently. Go over to come to the tools and APIs within VRO that you can use to externalize your content, uh, take it from source and build it into .package files and push it into other orchestrators over time or in, in different environments. Uh, and then we'll also have a little demo on how uh, you can use Concourse for this. So Concourse is, say, Pivotal's open source CI CD tool. It's just one example of how you could use it to automate this whole process of taking your uh, orchestrator content and pushing it into different environments. So the main reason why I like to externalize the content out of orchestrator is over time figuring out what changed by who. So in this scenario, we uh, this is actually came from an actual project um, uh, you know teammates have done, and we have uh, you know this is our, in our private GitHub. Uh, we have a comment that says we have a a, a commit here that shows we have a second version with a few changes, which is completely not descriptive, and it has say a package file here that has everything in it. And I can't even this is the second version, so I can't even tell what changed because it's a binary. I can't diff a binary. Uh, ideally, what you want to see is say a more descriptive, you know, commit message. Like here, we added a workflow description, and we are able to. You know, since we are managing this, say, with source instead of uh, binaries, we could show what actually changed between those th this version. So in this case, we added a workflow description, and I can actually see what that description is, as well as I guess notice that the version of the workflow changed from nine to ten, and we actually visually see that here. So that's what you like to see when you're making changes in your automation environment, I believe. So which would your team prefer? Right, you want to see uh, uh, just an update, or you want to see what actually changed as an example over time. The latter, right? I hope. Okay, good. So we're help. I'm going to show you how you can do that with a VRO uh, today. So why would you want to use um, an SCM or a source code management system like Git? Um, so more and more of our projects or whatnot are. You know, have code, have scripts, have configurations that are text, and um, it's just going to continue growing. So if your teams don't currently use a source uh, repository for any of the stuff, you should consider using it. Um, and a lot of times, you can trigger a lot of automation with this as well, because uh, a lot of times source systems are, uh, you know, can be triggered, trigger systems to make changes with that, right? And a lot of times you want to know, you just want the latest version of whatever config or script you want. You don't want to dig through, say, uh, you know, file share and figure out which one's the latest. You want to be presented just the latest at that time. And so that's what a, like a source control system like Git helps you do. So it's also um, provided by products like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, um, so if you know you have those types of uh, 
you know, products in your environment, you could consume those as well. Uh, so these aren't the only versions here. Um, there are also other things, uh, older, ver or older systems that are still valid and um, can give you the productivity you're looking for around, say, like Subversion, Perforce, Team Foundation, you could use those as well. So if, you, if you're currently not using it, I would recommend you try to read it, reach out to other teammates in your organizations that do things like config management with like Ansible, Chef, Puppet, or any PaaS work around Kubernetes, OpenShift, um, and um, Cloud Foundry. Um, they typically manage a lot of config files, a lot of YAML, and use Git systems regularly. Um, so why would you use a version control instead of a file share? I mean, key reason, um, where, where are these the, the differences? Why would you pick one over the other? Uh, usually with a version control, access is granted, say, per project. You know, with a file share, though, you could probably add, you know, more uh, specific ACLs or whatnot per file or folder. You really can't do that with, say, a version control. It's by project, though. So you could uh, get permission by project. With a version control, you're going to be able to track changes, say, per commit. You'll be able to describe what changed by who and when. There are a lot of different tools available to actually compare those changes over time. Uh, you can visualize how, how branches and commits work from that. Um, and generally, if you're just using a file share for something like this, you're going to have like full copies of things like in separate folders. Uh, it may be hard to track over time. So generally, though, uh, you know, file shares are great for binaries, but they're not great for text. So use your version control for anything text and file shares for binaries. So how do you start with this within VRO? So the easiest way to start this is to start off with a Java client, take your package, right click, go to expand as package, export as package, and it will create a folder there for you of all your content as, as source. So what's in this folder that just got created you know, locally? You're going to get a source folder, a main, and within this, um, you know, the root folder, you're going to have um, a POM file that describes the package itself. We're going to be able to describe what it is. And within, say, this resources folder, you're going to have actually all the content. So in this case, we've got workflows. But in addition, we could have all your actions your config elements, your resource elements, they would all get exported here as well. So what's in that POM file? So the POM file kind of describes your project. So it describes here's what your, your, pro, your um, you know, package name is. Um, here's where it, like the, the package signing certificate could be found, the version that this thing came from, items like this. So this is used by by uh, some of the API tools to build the package. So once we got all the source out of VRO, right, we want to be able to build a package. So we got a couple dependencies to do this first. You need a, a Java runtime. You'll need a current version of Maven, which is a, a build tool. And you'll need to uh, create a package signing certificate and you'll need access to a, uh, a VCO repo. So a VCO repo in this case has all the magic jars and whatnot that Maven needs to build your package file. And so by default, you can get the VCO-repo from a standalone VRO appliance. And there's a URL there under uh, available to get that. And so once we exported that uh, initial source package, it has hard-coded in it the URL to their VCO repo to get, get, get the uh, plugins that Maven needs. So here, here's how you go about the uh, signing a package signing certificate. So everything in black you would keep the same, but uh, the greens are things you would change, say, per organization. right? So we don't need to create this package signing certificate 
per package. You could just create this once for your team and use it in all your packages. So the key things we want to be aware of is um, the key store that the certificate is going to go into. So that's what this file here is. Um, we'll need to sign, make a password in order to access it or write to that key store. And you'll want to define your own kind of distinguished name for your particular your organization. So in this case, we're going to actually create the certificate. It's going to be valid for 10 years. So you can modify that if you like. Um, but this key tool is uh, provided by the, the, the JDK, or the JRE. So once you have your Java runtime, this, you already have this tool uh, to create your package signing certificate. So once we have that, we need to uh, uh, get access to your VCO repo. So you, you can do that just by using the appliance. Or if you don't necessarily want to run an appliance in your build environment or your lab just to have access to a VCO repo, you could actually extract the contents of the VCO repo and build a container and run it from there. So that's what this particular project I built does. It has all the instructions to extract the VCO repo and put it into a container, uh, an Nginx-based container. And that way, you can just um, run it in your existing lab, lab infrastructure instead of spinning up an orchestrator instance just to do builds. So it's handy, I find, if you're uh, doing something that's testing or whatnot on your laptop, you don't need to have, say, a whole orchestrator running. You could just um, start up the Docker container and have access to this content to build your packages. So after we have the uh, package signing certificate, we have to go update the POM in this particular case. So once we you know, extracted initially, it had a, a key store location here you know, that needs to be filled in. So we need to fill it in with the name of that key store file, as well as the password for that particular key store. And currently, um, when you've exported this initially from VR VRO, the VCO version here needs to be uh, truncated. We need to remove the build number out of it. So in this case, we have 760 plus a build number. We just want it to be 7.6.0, and that's, that's it. Um, what I like to do as well, this is how um, it starts off with. We have a, the, the VCO repo is defined inside of the YAML in two different places, inside the XML here in two different spots. And so over time, you may upgrade your VCO infrastructure, or you may um, build this in a different environment than what you developed the package from initially. So I like to be able to make this uh, configurable at runtime or build time. And so what we could do is create a, an additional property within this Maven file called like, uh, repo URL. And we could uh, s specify a new place you know, to fetch the VCO repo content from. Um, and that way, uh, we could overwrite it at runtime, at build time. So here's how like a package build would would look. So we're gonna have our POM file in a, in this package folder, and we'll run it, a Maven package, and it will uh, look at that POM file, and and build our dot package file in the target folder. So there's our, our package that we got there. So what we just did was we took source, we used Maven to build a package file, and um, we can override some things at, at build time if we wish, right? So we could say override our, our repo URL um, as well as the VCO version of what that VCO repo is a version of. Um, and we could also create like a non-editable package. So anyone noticed how, say, the uh, packages that come out of the box, or the, the workflows that come out of the box in VRO, like with the, pack, with the plugins, you cannot edit. So you could do that yourself here if you wish, say, uh, if you want to create packages for your production environment that are not editable, you could uh, change, change this flag here to remove the E and just be VF, and that will create a read-only package. 
that gets imported. So, so since these are properties, we can override them at build time, if you wish. So that was one cycle. What if we needed to get additional content out of VRO, right, for the same package? So there's another uh, Maven plugin available um, called a, a, that would be an import package. And what it does is it imports content from that VRO into your, into your local Git repo, uh, local, local, local files so you can uh, post it to Git. So this works with the same package. So uh, once you have that package available and the Maven all, fi all the Palm all configured, you'll be able to execute this to get, say, an update as an alternative to using the UI. It's an alternative. So how do we get the packages back into an appliance? So uh, there's just a, a REST API available that will that you can use curl with or even a power VRO if you happen to be using that. Um, so you take your, you'll be able to take our package file and we can, we can just push it with this command here. Uh, you do have an option as well over, the, over this API to say uh, if you want it, uh, for your config elements, you may want to just ignore those values or you could overwrite them uh, at as you, as you push the package. So that's just doing it manually. What if we want to automate this process? Say we want to, as content is checked into Git, we want to be able to build it and then push it to different environments. And so that's something, that's something you can do with a tool like Concourse. And it has, um, it has different, you know, ways it can receive content. So as resources that, that are ways to get things in and out of concourse. It has jobs that you define as a pipeline. And within jobs, you'd have individual tasks that you would run, which is like the lowest level of the pipeline. So similar tools that you may already have as well, like Jenkins, or Bamboo, or GitLab CICD, you can do the same, same stuff with. So here's what an example pipeline uh, to build packages would look like. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, have a job called build packages. It's gonna have some incoming resources. Um, since uh, concourse is very stateless, we have to track, say, version numbers outside of it. So in this case, this version resource is, um, is an S3 bucket. Um, and we have a triggering resource, which is our Git repo. So if it notices any changes against this Git repo, it'll trigger a build. And we have two different outgoing resources. We have uh, our next version uh, for the next build, as well as, say, a GitHub release. So this will take our build.package file and push it as a, as a GitHub release and tag the uh, Git repo as well. So here's what a build job looks like. So we've had a change committed to, to Git. It checked out that Git repo. It got the current version. It's running the Maven build inside of Concourse Worker. And then it will um, create a tag on the Git repo as well as push the binary out as a GitHub release. So I just built the package and stored it in an artifact repository called you know, GitHub releases. What if, now what we could also do is push, uh, say, this package to our orchestrator appliances. So in this case, this is an example pipeline as well. We have a job, two different incoming resources. So these, uh, the triggering resource here is our GitHub release. So whenever a new tag is pushed out as a GitHub release, this will trigger a push um, to our orchestrator nodes. So here's what this looks like here. So a prior package pushed a, a, a release to GitHub. This pulled it down. We'll pull down our Git repo as well because it has all the scripts that run our build itself, or it runs our push commands. 
And then we went ahead and pushed it to a particular orchestrator appliance I'd configured in the pipeline. And it could be uh, just one, one uh, orchestrator, it could be several orchestrators, it could even be several packages and several orchestrators you could do. So all those pipelines I have available in um, these two different uh, packages um, that, that, that are available are on uh, Sample Exchange as well as GitHub. Uh, they use two different Docker-based tools here, which are just uh, Docker files that you use to create containers that use content from an orchestrator appliance. And they have instructions on how to get those built there as well. And uh, a handy thing I had a, a, I was working with a client on was uh, taking, say, a configuration element and using it within a build within a build process. So the idea there is that we would have a config element that will list out all of our say production VRO instances, and that or or lab instances, whatever, whatever instances we want to push the packages to. So, uh, so this sample exchange script here as well will parse the source of a configuration element and give you, say, uh, the list of VRO hosts, right? So you can define an array of strings within a configuration element and make it available to a script, like a bash script or whatnot, uh, to push content with. So that way you could kind of do all your config of the pipeline and whatnot in Orchestrator where you're familiar with it. Any questions? That's about the end of the, I believe that's the, yep. So please fill out your survey. If you haven't checked in um, to, to the session, you won't be able to submit your survey. So please check in and, and submit a survey. That would be great, greatly appreciated. And I'll leave this up if you want to get a copy of it or whatnot. So.